Welcome back, guys. We're going to get straight into business. We got Jim Bergman from Measure Quick, and the conversation is based around low ambient charging and using a charging blanket to help with that. And Jim talks about, like I say to him, listen, back in the day, I used cardboard and blocked the front of the condenser. And he goes on to tell us why that's not the greatest way. And a charging blanket off the top of the condenser is probably better. So let's get to this guy's educational one. This is the HVAC Know It All podcast. I'm your host, Gary McCready. As an HVAC contractor, we need to be insured. And it makes a lot of sense to have the same insurance company look after all our needs. Lambert Insurance Services has been protecting HVAC contractors since 2009. From general liability to workers' comp, bonding, commercial auto, and more, they've got you covered. Call Lambert Insurance Services for a free quote at 801-937-7030. So we got Jim Bergman back here with us. Low ambient charging, Jim. It's something we got to do here and I've had to do several times here in Canada. And I mean, I've seen videos of you recently using a, I guess it would be called a, would it be called a charging blanket, I guess? Yeah, yeah. Charging yeah, bag or balloon. Charging or, blanket. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, the way you can go into this in detail with the blanket and measure quick and all that kind of stuff for sure. But the way I seem to have luck in the past was just covering the coil and getting the, the condensing pressure up to a point where I wanted it. And then that was the way I would go about charging a system was just blocking the condenser with some cardboard and it seemed to work real fine. I've never actually used one of those charging blankets before. So it'd be interesting to get your take on it. Yeah. So actually I did a pretty extensive studies on this stuff back, oh gosh, about 10, 12 years ago. Cause we were doing, I was doing a lot of work in, uh, in education and teaching at the time. And what we found is that when you took a condenser coil and you blocked it with cardboard, like you actually change the design temperature difference of the coil, actually change how its operating characteristics are. Because if you think about it, like refrigerant always has to enter the top of the coil because we have this cool mm -hmm. thing called gravity that's going to allow that liquid to sort of run towards the bottom, right? So you always mm -hmm. want to feed the discharge gas in the top, let the liquid collect at the bottom. And when you start blocking off the coil, especially if it's like a multi-circuited coil, which a lot of them are today, you start really affecting the design characteristics of the coil and you can't charge as accurately as you might think you could. If you're thinking like a lot of coils today, they, they might have four or five rows of coil and they do that to mitigate pressure drop, right? You don't want one really, really long coil with a single pass in it because you have a huge pressure drop in it. So they might have effectively five coils stacked on top of each other. And so now you block one of the coils at the top and you have the bottom one wide open and it changes the whole characteristic of the coil and it becomes really easy to either overcharge or undercharge the system. Primarily, you'd end up overcharging uh, because you end up uh, creating some conditions in the condenser that just make it easy to do that. So mm -hmm. the, the idea with a charging blanket is you you don't cover the coil itself, you're basically blocking the discharge of the coil, recirculating the warm air that the condenser would normally discharge back into the condenser and create ambient conditions in the condenser that are very similar to those that would be at a high outdoor air temperature. And it's also got the beauty of being very, very adjustable, right? Because you can open or close the strap on there and dial in the head pressure exactly where you want to dial it into. So. Mm -hmm. And the, the blanket, just for the audience's sake, the blanket basically is a restriction of the outgoing air, not the incoming air through the coil. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. It's the exhaust air going out. And all it does is basically is your choke. Is, it's a, think of it like a micro tent. So you strap it around the top of the condenser and you have an adjustable orifice then that you're closing down to basically force the condenser air to recirculate back into the condenser or, or just it builds up a pressure. And then that pressure sort of chokes back the air ex exhausting and you end up effectively raising the, the temperature around the entire condenser up. I have experimented with the the cardboard on the on the inlet and on the outlet, pushing down on the onto the fan. But what you gotta be careful of there is you could put too much resistance on the fan and cause it to overamp too. So what it, does this charging blanket cause any issues with the fan overamping or no, anything like that? I've run it for honestly I've run it for twenty four hours in my shop with a charging blanket on and it doesn't create that kind of resistance that it causes a uh, excessive amp draw on the condenser fan. So we've tested that multiple times. Charging blankets have been around for a long time. What we really did was we took and automated the process of using it in Measure Quick, right? I mean, it's interesting because a lot of techs don't stop and think about what's actually happening inside the system when you have low ambient uh, conditions. And low ambient, I mean, it can be cold 
you know, we can talk about low ambience being cold outside, cold inside, or both. And a, a lot mm -hmm. of times when we're talking about using a charging blanket, we're cold outdoors, but we also have low load indoors. And so that presents some unique challenges. And if you want, I can go over like how those are solved. And I didn't, you know, I don't know how much detail you want me to go in, but I'd be glad to go in a little bit of detail on that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're more than welcome to, to do so. So a lot of times, you know, like when we're charging, especially with a TXV system, we're, we're focused on subcooling. But you got to remember, subcooling doesn't tell the full story because you have to look at both sides of the system in order for to, to understand if the system's charged properly, right? Because a, a TXV only responds to superheat at the evaporator outlet. And so mm -hmm. their job is to maintain that consistent superheat by adjusting the refrigerant flow based upon the evaporator heat load, right? So it, it doesn't have anything to measure subcooling. It doesn't know what the subcooling is. All it knows is that if the superheat is low, it's going to close. If the superheat is high, it's going to open. So when we talk about superheat meeting low, the evaporator coil is flooded. There's too much refrigerant in the evaporator. When the superheat is high, then the evaporator is starved, right? And this is where it gets into where a charging blanket really matters because what a lot of technicians forget is that a TXV requires a differential pressure in order to operate. And so like R22, it's around 100 pounds, R410A, 454B, R32, like 160 pounds uh, differential pressure minimum for that valve to properly function. And so what happens is under low load conditions, we can have basically a low differential pressure. Refrigerant starts stacking in the condenser. We end up with what looks like high subcooling, but it's because the valve's essentially sitting there wide open. It can't open any further, but there's not enough pressure across the TXV to actually feed the refrigerant that it needs into the evaporator coil. And this is where we end up with those low load characteristics, you know, where the valve gets wonky and we end up with this like hunting and flooding and uh, the, the valve just really doesn't maintain well. And that's because we have all this refrigerant sort of stacking in the condenser just because it basically becomes too efficient at the low load outdoors condition, right? The idea here is that we do two things with that charging blanket. Number one is we're going to increase the head pressure. And by increasing the head pressure, we get the valve into the sweet spot where it can actually start to control, right? And so it allows the valve to modulate open and closed like it's supposed to. It's not stuck in this wide open position. And now it's really important concept to understand that whatever refrigerants is in the evaporators in the evaporator and whatever refrigerants in the condensers in the condenser, and it really doesn't change much from a hot day to a cold day or a high load to a low load. If the valve's designed to maintain 10 degrees of superheat, the amount of refrigerant change in that evaporator is so, so small that we don't even really see changes in subcooling target at different loads, right? Because, I mean, if you look at like a typical unit, it's, it's 10 degrees of subcooling. It doesn't matter whether it's a 50 degree day or a 100 degree day, it's, it's 10 degrees of subcooling, right? Now that does change a little bit when you get into some micro channel and things like that, but that's more because they increased head pressure than the refrigerant temperature changing. But the high subcooling doesn't mean anything except in a lot of cases, the refrigerant's not leaving the condenser, right? And meanwhile, the evaporator's running this high superheat because the valve's wide open and tends to, intended to feed more refrigerant. So what we got to do is we got to raise the pressure, raise the temperature, get the valve working in a sweet spot. The other thing it does is really cool is it raises the temperature of the liquid. And raising the temperature of the liquid actually adds some artificial load to the system. And this is no different than if we have a, you know, a 100-degree day we're going to have a lower split temperature split across the evaporator than we would have, let's say, on a maybe a 70 degree day, because a lot of the energy that goes into converting the um, that goes into dropping the liquid down to its saturation temperature is absorbed in flash gas, right? So we want to minimize flash gas because and you know, get the liquid as close to the saturation temperature of the evaporator as possible because that's going to increase the efficiency. I mean, that's why. We talk about increasing subcooling increases evaporator efficiency. Same, yeah. same concept, right? That's why a lot of a lot of units out there use subcoolers, right? To yeah, exactly. Yeah, we want to get the liquid temperature as close to saturation temperature of the uh, evaporator. So it's, sometimes people say it's the subcooling that does it, but it's really not the subcooling as much as it's the liquid getting closer to the uh, saturation temperature of the evaporator. Can I bring up something that might be important to, to sure. some people that chart? So back in the day, our, let's say a, a rooftop gets landed on a strip mall or something like that, and that space that it's cooling 
even needs to be cooled in the winter time for whatever reason. Maybe they got a bunch of servers or something in there sure. and that's what they've used. Well, a lot of times the the application of that rooftop that gets landed is not outfitted for low ambient application. So back in the day, our poor man's low ambient kit was a wind baffle. It was a crankcase heater and it was a fan cycle control. And it seemed to do the trick. Since then, I've come to the realization that cycling a fan is not as nearly as good as maintaining a fan speed because then you don't have the, the pressure flu fluctuations up and down, up and down. But if you do have a fan cycle control and you are trying to use like a charging blanket, as you're saying, trying to charge it, you need to put that fan, basically bypass that fan cycle control and have that fan running const at constant speed because if it's going up and down like this, it's going to make your day hell because you're going to be like, well, how, how am I supposed to dial this in when it's going all over the place? It's not the pressures change really, really fast. What takes a few seconds to stabilize is liquid temperature because the, the liquid has mass and that mass takes time to cool off. And then you got the mass of the copper line that's you know, around that liquid too. So all those things take time to change. So what we'll see rapid fluctuations in pressure, it's the liquid that takes time to stabilize. And this is again, where a charging blanket makes it very handy because we can dial that in. And then what we're doing is using software. We have stability algorithms in the software to determine when the liquid line temperature stable, the superheat stable, subschooling stable. And then, you know, it tells you whether we got to add or remove refrigerant into the system. So it's it's really quite slick in the way that that works because it's solving multiple problems. Again, adds a little bit of false load to the system by raising the liquid line temperature up and uh, creating conditions that are a little bit closer to, to normal, getting that differential pressure where we need it across the valve so the valve can start to react properly and then increasing the head pressure so that we can feed the feed the valve properly. So it's it's all it all sort of works together to allow this to happen. Now it does have limitations. Like you you can only use a charging blanket from about 70 down to about 30, 35 degrees. And once you get below that, it just gets too cold for the, you know, even with a charging blanket to get enough load or differential pressure across there to do what it's supposed to do. And you also got to consider like, is the system designed to run in those, in, in that low of an ambient temperature, right? I mean, down to in the thirties, we're not going to really hurt in, anything, even with air conditioning um, typically, but if we run it much below that, you know, the less equipment's designed for it, it could be a problem. And you also you know, want to do things like sometimes make sure if the manufacturer calls for it to be powered up for you know, 24 hours or something that one of the first things you do is set the condenser and get power going to it and let it warm up while you're doing the piping or whatever so that, you know, that crankcase heater is getting a chance to heat up and, and the systems, you know, compressor is getting warmed up, whatever it has to be. Because mm -hmm. that's also, if you're trying to avoid a return trip, you also got to make sure the condenser's had enough time to get the refrigerant migrated out of the compressor and into the receiver and condenser or whatever, you know, wherever it's going to go. For sure. So I, I got two things here. Um, one, I'm sure that I've seen this from you on LinkedIn about you're not totally convinced that the weigh-in is the best way to go because you've seen weigh-in oh, charges yeah, yeah. not be correct on nameplates. Is that, am I right in saying that? Is that from, yeah, you, no, you I just had, I just had it happen on a, on a new unit that I put in at my place. I, I moved from my house. I bought a, a condo and the first thing I did was tear everything out and put a heat pump in and cut in the, uh, you know, got it down to. 75 microns go to cut the charge in and it was low on charge right from the factory and i worked for train for many many years and and train with every package unit they put up they said you know always it was part of the startup was checking the super heat checking the sub cooling and making sure it was charged correctly and i'll guarantee you 15 to 20 percent of the rooftops we worked on had uh, needed a charge adjustment it was just they aren't perfect from the factory. Things get damaged in transit. Sometimes service valves aren't fully seated all the way. Uh, there can be a, a plethora of things that happen. You know, maybe it's not even matched. You know, today you can match a condenser with half a dozen different evaporator coils. Well, what size coil was that charge designed for? You know, and line set lengths vary and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I'll weigh in something, but always, always check superheat and subcooling. You know, it's yeah, really, yeah. Really I mean, critical. from installations I used to do back when I first started, there was a lot of split machinery, but it was for server rooms and data centers. And these were mm -hmm. leaders and they never came with a weighed in charge because they couldn't tell you what it was supposed to be because it was dependent on your line lengths and how far away the two pieces of equipment were. So it was all, you had to go through the, the manual and, and basically read on how you're supposed to charge 
the system because you're charging it from scratch. You're not charging yeah. it from any any point of way. And those Lieberts are even more complicated because a lot of them ran flooded condensers. And so you, you had a whole charging process you had to follow really intimately to get the, some of those charged. Depends on what they did. Yeah, some of them were easy. Some of them were actually, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, some of them actually said to block the condenser coil and fill the receive because some of the receivers had two sight glasses in them. Right. This is like old day instructions. I don't know what they are now because it's been a while, but it was like block the condenser and fill the receiver up to this height in the second sight glass. And that was your charging. That was like their yep. instructions of well, how yeah, to do that, it. That was a whole different process because you're talking about flooded condenser controls now and you were trying to get the the head pressure high enough to simulate certain conditions so that you get the system in a condition where you could back the refrigerant up into the receiver and then, you know, get the receiver level right. So that was, that made sure that at low ambience, you had enough refrigerant in the system so that up the flooded condenser could maintain the head pressure. Just yeah. a whole different, I mean, but those systems used a boatload of refrigerant compared to, you know, like condenser fan cycling today or, mm -hmm. or even a, a variable frequency fan, you know, there's a much better ways of controlling head pressure today than flooded condenser. I don't know from a control standpoint, I mean, flooded condenser was awesome because it's really, really just, good job. Um, but it was, yeah, it was a mechanical a device, yeah. a mechanical device. And the, basically the condenser fans ran, ran full bore at all times. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the way they ran. You could go up uh, onto the roof and it could be minus 30 degrees Celsius out and all three condenser fans are going full bore. It's yep. that mechanical floodback device that was maintaining the, the pressure in the condenser. Yeah, and, um, and charging blankets are more designed for like, you know, re residential, like commercial systems, rooftop stuff, maybe up to, you know, like five tons or, or maybe a little bit higher, but they're not really designed for commissioning uh, stuff like Yeah, the, I know. I just, I just wanted to bring it up because it's just part of my experience, and I know some of the audience might be experiencing some of that too. But the second point I wanted to make is the procedure with the charging blanket is what about heat pumps? Are we able to do this with heat pumps too, or is that a different? Yeah, absolutely. Now heat pumps are charged always in the cooling mode. Mm -hmm. right? We don't have any, any manufacturers out there that really have a prescriptive method of saying, this is how you definitively charge a heat pump in the heating mode in the, in a winter time. And you don't have a return trip for the summer. I mean, you have to charge them in cooling mode because just the, the way that heat pumps are designed. So that, that said, you know, we can, as long as the temperature is above 30 degrees, we can put the heat pump in the cooling mode and, and, uh, get it to a point. And that's what I had to do with mine. I mean, I just charged mine up a couple of weeks ago and it was 40, 40 some degrees outside and I threw a charging blanket on and got it dialed in exactly where I wanted it to go. 